Hello guys and gals, me Mudahar, and ladies and gentlemen, North Korea is getting better at hacking computers, and this time they're not just hacking the average Windows person or even the Lunix person. No, today they're actually going out of their way to hack Mac users, and you might be wondering why that's happening. Now before we begin, North Korea is pretty much in the news for like a million things all the time, and I made plenty of videos talking about North Korean propaganda, North Korean television, North Korean operating systems, but I, it's really their hacking groups that really excite me the most. If you ever followed North Korea and looked up groups like the Lazarus Group, which is probably one of North Korea or the DPRK's greatest hacking unit that they have, and they've seriously done some real damage to some pretty big targets, then uh, this whole story will make a lot of sense. Now recently, North Korea was pretty much in the news for sending uh, their soldiers out to fight in the Russian-Ukraine war. And uh, in this scenario, it actually appeared that once you gave North Korean soldiers a little bit of access to that internet, they became actual serious coomers. I would consider this to be like a psychological operation, but uh, honestly, any man that has been given access to the internet for the first time and starts to look up big booties on the internet probably isn't that inclined in fighting. I mean, seriously, there's a video right here where allegedly this North Korean agent is apparently, finally, for the, for the first time in his life, looking up big booties. Watch this. That dude is a straight coomer. You can see him just scroll up through the old TikTok feeds. Now, to be fair, all right, it is what it is. Uh, one shouldn't be super surprised. It's a pretty natural human thing to see. But ladies and gentlemen, beyond all of the North Korean soldiers, it's more interesting looking at their actual hacks. Now, if you ever looked up the relationship that North Korea and Russia have, it starts to make a little bit more sense as to why this occurs. Now, there's a post actually by the US Department of State where they actually have these TIP reports, trafficking in person, where they actually do talk about, you know, countries like Russia and sometimes their involvement with the North Koreans. So right over here, the US government, they say the Russian government does not meet the full minimum standards for the elimination of tra trafficking, which is understandable. Obviously, these are adversarial nations. I'm sure they have a lot of stuff to say about each other. So one of the things they go into and talk about this is obviously the Russian government operated a sprawling filtration operation and detention system that included the use of forced labor. The government continued to perpetuate the Democratic People's Republic of Korea's imposition of forced labor conditions on North Korean workers. The government did not screen North Korean workers in Russia for trafficking indications or identify any North Korean trafficking victims, despite credible reports in previous years that the DPRK operates work camps in Russia and exploits thousands of North Korean workers in forced labor. Now, this is something that doesn't really shock me. If you ever followed like a channel known as Vice back in the day when they were doing like super hard hitting documentaries, uh, you could actually have seen like actual North Korean labor camps on Vice themselves where they actually go down and cover this like as close to the actual thing as they can. I mean, one of them ends up being one of these logging camps where allegedly these North Korean workers are just sent out here to make a crap ton of money for the North Korean regime. And really, they can't run away once they even leave the country because honestly, if they do, their families are usually going to end up paying the price back in the day. It's a pretty interesting documentary, literally uploaded 12 years ago. So if you ever missed out on this, I highly recommend you go check it out. But obviously, it benefits the North Korean elite to make as much money as they can through basically pimping out their people. Now, this is at one point where like a country can literally operate like a crime family, but still be treated like a full on country. Now, forced labor isn't the only form of money making North Korea will make. Uh, literally as of a few days ago, there was one group known as JMF, their threat labs actually discovered some pretty weird computer viruses that were targeting actual Mac users. So according to these guys over here, they discovered samples that were uploaded to VirusTotal. Those samples involved games like Minesweeper. Now, uh, you know, when you look at things like this and you start to see zero out of 64, VirusTotal, for those of you who don't know, is a great resource. So if you wanna just quickly do a virus scan on a file that you've downloaded from the internet, just drag and drop it into VirusTotal and it'll run it across multiple antivirus engines. Now, I feel like it's best to describe how antivirus engines work. Sometimes, you know, you'll, you'll see like one out of 64. And if it's usually a unknown antivirus like engine or a vendor that flags a certain piece of software, you probably don't have to worry about it too much. 
It's only when this number starts to reach like in the double digits that you really have to worry, especially when the vendors are pretty popular ones like Kaspersky or, you know, Microsoft, for instance, you know, the big names in the game. If they're calling your stuff a virus, there's probably some heft to it. So when you see zero out of 64, that's still not something for you to just completely be okay with. That sometimes could mean that a virus hasn't been detected or the heuristics don't necessarily immediately flag underneath any of it. So when looking closely into it, it appeared to actually match uh, ARM processors or more specifically Mac users. So, all right, okay, why are the North Koreans going after the Mac users or how are they even targeting them? So according to JMF, they were apparently targeting in three forms, all right? The malware came in three variants, a Go variant, a Python variant, and a Flutter built application. Now Flutter is actually an open source framework that allows you to build applications and maintain a level of cohesiveness between multiple platforms. So you can design things for Mac OS, you can design things for iOS, you can design things for Android, and make sure that things are pretty cohesive. Google is are the people that are actually behind this, and it's not even entirely their fault. What North Korean hackers are doing is utilizing a bunch of these tools in order to inject serious computer viruses, raise and escalate privileges, and target applications. So when JMF decided to go down into it, they decided to show how this actually works. For instance, the malware, which the Flutter applications, they were created and they were described as a stage one payload. So a stage one payload is effectively run on your system and it's effectively designed for you to start communications with a malicious server somewhere else in the world. And at this point, that malicious server obviously belongs to the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. So they identified six infected applications, five of which were signed using actual developer account signatures. And of course, as they discovered this, even Apple jumped into it and found that there was something shady in which they removed it. So that Minesweeper that I talked about a little bit earlier that they discovered was actually one that belonged to the Baltimore Jewish Council. At least that's the developer ID that signed it. That has since been revoked by obviously Apple because it obviously was being maliciously used by the North Koreans. Now, when looking closely at the actual Minesweeper game that they were targeting, this game that was built with Flutter, it looks something close to this, okay? So there's actually some footage you can watch of this. So this looks like your standard Minesweeper game. Again, it's just some tiny, small, little mobile title, and you might not think too much about it. But within this software, within this, you know, game, at least the version that was floating around contained a callback to the North Korean server. So you could just be playing Minesweeper and all of a sudden your device is starting to communicate with the fucking enemy. So according to, again, JMF Threat Labs, when you look closely at it, the actual uh, the actual uh, host that they were connecting to was mbupdate.linkpc.net. Now, LinkPC is not something, you know, completely new, according to Elastic Security Labs. That's actually a pretty legitimate domain address that you can communicate to, right? Now, according to the guys over at Elastic Security Labs, LinkPC, that domain of itself, is actually a pretty legitimate second level domain. So you don't really have to worry too much about just seeing it. But of course, it's pretty well documented that this is used by actual threat actors for something known as C2. For anybody that doesn't know what C2 is, C2 is effectively the command and control server. So when you get infected, especially with these type one payloads and you start communicating to servers outside, you know, your, your understood scope, what, what'll happen is as you start communicating to those North Korean servers, those servers can then issue commands back to your computer. So effectively your computer kind of joins a botnet or it joins, you know, effectively this giant cloud of other infected users. So for example, if the North Koreans wanted you to send, you know, uh, malicious packets, be part of a DDoS attack to anybody in the world, all that command server has to do is relay a command and anybody that communicates to it will just get the command and start issuing it. So that's effectively what a C2 server does. And of course, in this case, according to the guys over at Elastic Labs, there were plenty of these North Korean malicious, uh, you know, uh, command and control servers running. And they would use, you know, innocuous names like job intro or job description or data send or exodus, something that you might actually not immediately recognize if you didn't know what to look for, something that could have floated by your eyes. So you might be wondering, Muda, what was the end result of all of this? Well, according to the guys over at JMF Threat Labs, it actually appeared to show that it probably was a test for a future attack that is coming down the road. 
So basically the idea for them is that the actor is known for putting together highly convincing social engineering campaigns from start to finish, and the file names here do not align with the content displayed to the user within the Flutter build applications. This could perhaps be an attempt to see if a properly signed app with malicious code obscured within a dilib could get approved by Apple's notarization server and basically slip under the radar of antivirus vendors. So again, what's more important is seeing if they can actually target Mac OS users and have things fly under the radar. The longer they can stay stealthy and infect more users and then actually weaponize that at once is the really scary part of it, right? It's not about infecting like 200 people before you get caught. It's about infecting 200,000 people as silently as you can and then eventually release your load. That's kind of how it goes. And it's not just Apple. They want to target Linux. They want to target Windows users. They want to target your mobile devices. The more things they have under their grasp, overall, the better. Now, obviously, why would they choose to target anybody and why would North Korea want to hack? And that's where, again, the closer you look into it, the more it actually makes sense. Now, the United Nations is investigating around 58 alleged crypto heists actually done by North Korea. So apparently over the course of six years, they have been alleged to rake in about $3 billion with 58 different cyber attacks that have occurred. So those cyber attacks include, you know, Terraport Finance for $4 million, Atomic Wallet for $120 million, AlphaPo for $110 million, and of course, even Stake.com, which we even actually talked about uh, literally, I, I want to say just last year, the end of last year, for $41 million. This is a crazy amount of money that is just basically being stolen by North Koreans. And at the end of the day, because this is a state-run hack, it doesn't really matter about these people getting caught. North Korea is never going to extradite these people. And unless people are, unless other countries are willing to send militaries and boots on the ground, nothing is going to effectively happen. In the age of keyboard warfare, these guys can literally operate without ever getting arrested. It's, it's a license to steal en masse. Now, this money goes towards what is alleged to be a weapons of mass destruction program, which we'll get to in a little bit. But obviously, this kind of money helps the North Korean regime, specifically the Jong family, the Kim Jong uh, family, but also the other various elite, you know, people that live there. So if you look at like Pyongyang, like Changwang Street, which we looked at in the past, I mean, these are literal like mansions. These are affluent areas. And this kind of money, while, you know, it probably isn't going towards the elite as much as it would be the, uh, the, the Kim Jong dynasty, this is effectively a good source of revenue for these people to enjoy their riches. Obviously, this money most definitely doesn't trickle down to the most impoverished of the country, but you can kind of imagine how this works. I mean, you're talking about a country that wants to build their own variant of Dubai and are still not meeting actual deadlines. This is actually them talking about the Wonsan Kalma project, which literally did not even, I think, push forward. And this is back in like 2020. Uh, obviously, I don't think North Korea has the money to develop their own variant of Dubai, maybe a little bit just for the truly rich who live there but that's the only people that are benefiting. So in reality, all of these hacks that have effectively been occurring are hacks that are targeting actual cryptocurrency people. So now looking at Sentinel Labs, now even going to Sentinel Labs, who actually did look at, again, a suspected DPRK threat actor targeting actual crypto businesses with those multi-stage malwares. So cryptocurrency related businesses have actually been the target of North Korean affiliated threat actors for quite some time. With again, multiple of those heists we just looked at that the UN are investigating. Even back in 2023, Jamf Threat Labs literally was looking at macOS malware named Rust Bucket and how they were actually again, even compromising macOS devices back then. See Mac users, I think around like 15 to 20% of the global market but also a lot of people who are into crypto and a lot of people that are developing stuff, things like crypto, people who are in the programming sphere, most definitely use Mac devices. I mean, they're pretty much favored by a lot of developers uh, and for a good reason so, solid Unix devices. If you're gonna target businesses that are ultimately designing the actual crypto market and the crypto world, multiple crypto applications, it kind of makes sense to target the developmental devices than even the end user. And even Elastic reported on DPRK campaign targeting the actual engineers of a crypto exchange platform with a malware known as Candy Corn. 
Uh, don't ask me about the names. Uh, they literally just get made up like this all the time. So yeah, it really is North Korea not so much targeting the average person as they are targeting the people that are running this new cryptocurrency world that we're in. So even literally this year, the Federal Bureau of Investigations, as of September 3rd, 2024, actually started talking more about this. North Korea aggressively targets crypto industry with well-disguised social engineering attacks. So according to the FBI and their PSA, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea is conducting highly tailored, difficult to detect social engineering campaigns against employees of decentralized finance, cryptocurrency, and similar businesses to basically deploy malware and steal all of that currency out there, right? See, for all the people who are wondering why even bother targeting the individual person, when you can target the fucking banks, the people that run the exchanges, the casinos like stake that are actually sitting on massive shit tons of actual cryptocurrency. You can then send this to accounts and those accounts can then send it to be laundered. So what they said was North Korean social engineering schemes are incredibly complex and elaborate, often compromising victims with sophisticated technical acumen. So even if you think you know what you're doing, you're probably, you're the one being targeted. So you can imagine the kind of trickery being employed here. Given the scale and persistence of this malicious activity, even those well-versed in cybersecurity practices can be vulnerable. And that's no joke. Even people that think they know all about the scams in the world around them, those people are still susceptible. You're never, you're never too smart for a crypto scam, is what I'll say. So how they describe it is they have extensive pre-operational research. I mean, these people literally case every single group they can like crazy. Teams of North Korean cyber actors identify specific businesses to target and attempt to socially engineer dozens of the actual employees. I mean, they literally dig up as much information on the people they can engineer instead of blindly throwing out sphere phishing. So individualized fake scenarios. So North Korean malicious cyber actors incorporate personal details regarding an intended victim's background, skill, employment, or business interest to craft customized fictional scenarios designed to be uniquely appealing to the targeted person. And then of course, you've got crazy impersonation. They can impersonate a range of individuals, including contacts a victim may know personally or indirectly. I mean, imagine receiving a message from your parents and that message ends up being a spoof number that's just pretending to be your parents. I mean, there is a serious level of fucking mindfuckery going on. This is insane levels of social engineering that I don't think anybody is ready for. And how do you deal with these level of hackers? Well, according to the Federal Bureau, you have to find methods to verify somebody's identity using separate, unconnected communication platforms. I mean, literally, do not store information about cryptocurrency wallets, avoid taking pre-employment tests, or even executing code on company-owned laptops. I mean, that's just a fucking given. Use virtual machines. Use non-company connected devices. Be fucking intelligent for once in your life. And that's pretty much how the Federal Bureau puts it out. It's become so serious that the feds have to put out a public service announcement. And the way that North Korea kind of handles this is insane. I mean, there are literally situations where the actual State Department tells people about even IT workers that are working secretly for North Korea that are just making money to send back to the country. I mean, I'm not even joking when I make this up. From May 16, 2022, this got unclassified. The U.S. Department of State, Treasury, and the Feds issued this advisory for the international community. They said the DPRK dispatches thousands of highly skilled IT workers around the world to generate revenue that contributes to its weapons of mass destruction and ballistic missiles. So what they said was the IT workers take advantage of existing demands for specific skills. I mean, literally these people get jobs around the world, they make money, and that money allegedly goes back to financing actual weapons of mass destruction. They say DPRK IT workers provide a critical stream of revenue that helps fund the DPRK regime's highest economic and security priorities. So much like the alleged North Korean slave labor and the soldiers being forced to fight in a war that they have no real connection to, the IT workers of North Korea are also being pimped out, allegedly to build money for missiles and whatnot. Not for the food for the people, no, 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 not that. 
just for weapons, allegedly. Now, of course, this is the United States saying this, so clearly there's obviously going to be some level of bullshittery that you have to walk through. Remember, these are adversarial nations. The truth is usually somewhere in the middle, not usually the propaganda of one specific side or the other. According to the entire, like, according to the U.S. government, a DPRK IT worker earns 10 times more than a conventional laborer working in a factory or a construction project, obviously. IT workers can individually earn more than $300,000 a year, and teams of IT workers collectively earn more than $3 million in annually. A significant percentage supports the WMD program. So basically, the U.S. government is saying, don't hire North Korean people, do not hire their IT workers, because you're absolutely assisting them, uh, you're assisting the government into actually, you know, uh, financing the, the WMDs. And so they made this cute little chart to showcase how it works. So you're a client, you go to, from what I believe, the internet to a proxy account or an individual. So the way that apparently the government says that this works is an IT worker goes to a proxy account or an individual, and that person then creates credentials on a freelance work platform, okay, like Fiverr or some shit. And then they also use a digital payment service that goes to a client. Yes, this is how they get money. The client sends it to that, you know, digital payment service that they made an account on. That money goes to the IT worker and then the IT worker allegedly sends it back to the North Korean military. Even when you look at one of their big heists, and we talked about this a while back with Axie Infinity, a uh, web 3.0 game, where literally millions upon millions of dollars was stolen through something known as a Ronin Bridge. Uh, that money was then allegedly sent to a you know site known as Tornado Cash, which has its own OFAC sanctions. Again, this was a massive cryptocurrency mixer that literally was targeted by the United States Treasury sanctions because it was literally one actual group that laundered allegedly a shit ton of money. I mean, even back in August 8, 2022, they said the U.S. Department of Treasury says that Tornado Cash, uh, you know, the sanctioned virtual currency mixer, was used to launder more than $7 billion worth of virtual currency since 2019. I mean, just imagine $7 billion being laundered through one fucking service. Insane. And what the U.S. government said was that included $455 million stolen by the Lazarus Group, that, you know, DPRK, like, hacker group out there. So it's actually insane how much money gets floated around in the cryptocurrency space in heists and laundering alone. In the last few years, it's pretty much evident that North Korea is making a shit ton of money through cryptocurrency. And, you know, these heists that, you know, we kind of talked about a few years ago, like it used to be a dime a dozen. But now it really is that, you know, North Korea, if you thought that your favorite influencer was scamming people on crypto or using cryptocurrency for nefarious purposes, be it reminded that North Korea is allegedly on the hook for $3 billion worth of stolen cash, all in cryptocurrency. You know, if it's one thing North Korea has, is definitely talented keyboard warriors. And these kind of hackers are only getting smarter. So if you're somebody that's on the internet and you have cryptocurrency, or you might even think of dabbling in it, or shit, just in general, you may even have, you know, your bank accounts connected to your computer, you know, just saved ready to go, be careful about the kind of stuff you interact with on the internet, be careful with the kind of stuff you download, because the level of actual hacking is getting pretty intricate and good. And North Korea is just getting better. You know, it's easy to laugh at a country like this when they really don't have anything, but usually it's when you have nothing that you have the drive to pursue something. And these guys are really using everything they have to apply the craziest level of hacks to target the average person and big companies. And you got to start taking it seriously when you got agencies like the Federal Bureau of Investigation actually putting out PSAs warning people that these guys aren't your average fucking scammer. They are advanced scammers. And those are the kind of people you really got to watch out for. Ladies and gentlemen, this is me, Mudahar. And if you like what you saw, please like, comment, and subscribe. Dislike if you dislike it. I am out.